Good evening, everybody. Omidofo. Good evening. Tashidele. So the subject of this evening's talk is uh, transforming one's mind, transforming one's life. So mostly, I, I expect most of you have been practicing uh, the Dharma for, for many years. And so I hope that you understand that the, the main concern of Buddhism is that we learn how to tame and to train and then to transcend the mind. So everybody knows if we get up in the morning and we're feeling a bit grumpy and you know depressed then even the brightest day looks gray and miserable. And on the other hand, I don't know, if we've just fallen in love, suddenly even the darkest day is shining bright. So I think even on a very basic level, we understand that the, the mood of our mind determines how we feel about the day. So then, you know, really most people would choose to have um, a happy mind rather than a sad mind. So most people would prefer to wake up in the morning and think, you see, if we were in charge of our mind, this is the point, if we were the masters of our own mind, then we could determine ahead of time how we're going to feel. And so very few people would wake up in the morning and think, well, how shall I feel today? How about depressed, irritable, <laughs> frustrated, and generally uh, at, um, you know, at war with the rest of the world? That sounds like a good day. Most people, if they're given the choice, would say, I'd like a day in which I feel, I feel good, I, I feel peaceful, I'm able to deal with whatever problems come up, that basically I feel cheerful and happy and kind. So how is it, therefore, that for so many people, their, their, you know, their day is not happy and cheerful if we had a choice. So the reason is that although we think we are in control of our minds, actually we are not in control at all. So this is our problem. We spend a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of thought, on how to make ourselves feel much better and, and to feel happy, and yet we still end up feeling miserable. And not only do we feel miserable, but we make other people miserable too. I mean, very few people really determine that they're going to be as difficult and nasty as possible and create as many problems for everybody else as possible. People usually don't, decide they want to do that, but still we end up doing that. Why? So basically the, the Buddhist answer is that we, well two things here it's saying. One is that our minds are completely wild and untamed. And as long as they are wild and untamed, they are not going to obey our ideas of how a mind should be. Anybody who has sat down and tried to meditate will know what we're talking about here, right? We say right now, just sit and concentrate on the breath, breathing in, breathing out. Don't worry about anything. Just keep the attention on the breath. It sounds so easy, but as every person who has tried it soon discovers, within two minutes the mind has its own agenda. 
you know. I'm saying, right, breath, and the mind's already gone off somewhere else. I mean, the most common uh, complaint when people start to meditate is, oh, before my mind was okay, but now it's worse than it ever was before. But, of course, then they are told, no, no, it's just that now we are more conscious of how completely out of control our mind actually is. So what's the problem? Why does not the mind obey? when we ask it very politely to please settle down. So the, the essential, the basic reason is that um, the mind is the ordinary conceptual thinking mind we're talking about here, you know, our thinking. So our mind is run by something which we could call the ego. And this is a, a sense of, of self, which is very strong within us and is um, basically in control of the, uh, the conceptual mind. So this sense of self which we have inside us, which is so strong, this, this self, this ego, it can live in the past in our memories and ideas of the past. It can live in the future, dreaming and planning and fantasizing. But the one place it actually cannot live is in the present. If it is, thinks it's present, it is commenting on the present. The ego actually cannot remain without thinking about the present, not actually experiencing the present. And so this is why when we try to bring the attention to a single point, such as the breath or the mind stream or to an image of a Buddha or a mantra or anything, as soon as the mind settles in without thinking, then immediately the ego takes over again. So therefore the, the aim of uh, the Buddha Dharma is actually to really uncover the machinations of the, the ego, the, the, all the complexities that the ego, you know, the fact is that ego doesn't really exist, but we think it exists because we are identifying with our conceptual thinking. So, therefore, ultimately, we are trying to uh, see through the game that the ego is playing and recognize that actually the real state of affairs is not the way it is presented by our ordinary surface conceptual thinking. So therefore, the aim is to dissolve this sense, this sense of a little self, which seems to be at the center of everything we do. We are trying to dissolve it so that we can awaken into a state of much more uh, profound, primordial, primordial mm -hmm. awareness, which is our true nature. So this primordial nature of the mind is also called our, our Buddha nature, um, Tathagatagaba. Also the clear light nature of the mind. But meantime, we're stuck with our little self. And if we look at it, most of the path is how to deal with this ego, to make the ego a friend on the path towards its own dissolution. Because, of course, the, the nature of the mind doesn't need to be told to be kind, to be generous, to be patient. The nature of the mind is spontaneously kind and compassionate and wise and, and patient. We don't need to train that level of, of our primordial mind to do these things, but 
our ordinary little mind, our little ego, that is what needs to be trained first. So our ordinary mind, uh, ordinary not in the Mahamudra sense of ordinary mind, but um, our, our ordinary conceptual thinking mind, the problem is that as long as we have this sense of an I, which is separate from everything else, which is not I, there is going to be the, um, the reaching out and grasping and holding on to what gives pleasure to me and the pushing away, the aversion, the anger, irritation towards what seems painful to me. So this is why many of you will have seen the, um, the depiction uh, of the wheel of life, right? Uh, which is uh, divided into three to six uh, segments and around it the uh, 12 nidanas, the 12 links of conditioned origination. And at the center are the three animals. So the, the, these three animals, which is uh, a pig and a snake and a cockerel, and they're all biting each other's tails. So they're all uh, holding on to each other they are at the hub of the wheel. In other words, when they keep turning round, chasing each other, the whole wheel keeps going. So these three animals represent, first of all, the pig, which represents ignorance. That ignorance means, it doesn't mean that we don't understand quantum physics or we don't know the capital of Guatemala. It's not that kind of ignorance. It means ignorance of who we really are. And so from this, this fact that we identify with all the wrong things, actually, um, which constitutes our ignorance, from that stems the uh, snake that represents anger, and the um, cockerel, the, the, the cock, who represents desire or greed. So the idea is that from our basic unknowing of the nature of how things really are, therefore this um, bring, brings in its wake, as I say, this, this desire towards things which give pleasure to me, and this aversion or hatred towards things which seem to give pain. And, and so they go round and round and round and round, and then the whole wheel of birth and death and rebirth and redeath just keeps turning. So therefore, in all Buddhist schools, the question is how to deal with these poisons of the mind. Because like uh, the kind of poison which we drink, it disturbs the mind, it gives pain to the mind. When our minds are full of, of greed and longing or, or attachment, terrified to lose something, holding on desperately, we are not happy. Because as long as we have this, this tremendous greed and grasping, we are filled with Hope and fear. Hope that it's, we're going to keep it and fear that somehow we will lose it. For this reason, the Buddha said that this greedy, grasping attachment, holding on desperately, is what causes so much suffering in this world. And along with that, of course, is the negative side, the anger. Anger, hatred, aversion, irritation, frustration. We know this makes the mind unhappy. And so if our mind, along with things like jealousy, envy, somebody gets something we want or gets promoted and we should have gotten that job or anything that another person gets that we feel that we, we would have liked that um, rather than them. And so, and so we feel envy and jealousy 
or we think we are better than other people and we are full of our, our own um, self-glory, this, this feeling of pride, none of it brings peace to the mind. And so, therefore, with these kind of poisons coloring the mind the whole time, we, we suffer. We're, we're not happy inside. Coloring, or coloring? coloring. It's like if if the nature of the mind was this clear water, and then we throw into it dyes, red dyes, green dyes, black dyes, uh, it changes the color. And the mind is 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 you know it it's not settled. It's not peaceful. It's like to change the image. You know we. You know, you live in a city and there are always people employed to keep your city uh, streets clean and free from rubbish, garbage. And then in our, our homes, in our houses or apartments or rooms, we keep it clean. You know, we clean it every day and we make sure that the rubbish doesn't accumulate. We decorate it also very nicely, so we feel happy there. And then our bodies, we spend, you know, a lot of time, you know, cleaning the body, sh taking showers, washing our hair, cleaning our clothes, going shopping to buy new clothes, very caught up in how we appear, because we think, I am my body. But the place we really live, where we never can escape, no matter where we go, even in sleep, is in our mind. And how much time and effort do we give to cleaning out our mind? Making sure that it's clean and pleasant and beautifully decorated. How much trash do we allow to just accumulate without ever trying to clean it out? Sometimes I think if we all had uh, microphones attached to our brain and everybody could hear what we are thinking, wouldn't everyone want to learn to meditate? <laughs> so it's really true that if we transform our mind, we transform our life. And ultimately, we transform the world. Because the world is controlled by people whose minds are out of control. Which is why the world is in such a mess, no? I mean, it's well, doing I pretty well considering the kind of people running it, you know. <laughs> okay, so what can we do? First of all, we should understand that really it is not external circumstances and other people which are the real problem. The problem is our own mind, which is good news, right? Because we cannot change other people. We think other people are the problem, they need to change. But actually we cannot change other people, but we can change ourselves. It's very important that, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I, I really want to practice, but I have no time. I have family, I have my work, I have many, many um, pulls on my time. Uh, you know, I, I really would love to practice uh, Buddhism, but there just is no time to do it, sorry. So this is because sometimes it is presented that going to the temple, going to a Dharma center, listening to talks, reading Dharma books, meditating, chanting, this is Dharma practice. And the rest of our time with our family, with our, our, at our workplace, with our other interests, this is just so much worldly activity. But this is really a misunderstanding because whether we are in the Dharma center or the temple or whether we are with our family or at our workplace, our mind is there. And the whole practice of Buddha Dharma 
is to transform our mind. So therefore, wherever we go, that is the practice. Because wherever we go, mind goes with us. So therefore, we have to recognize, if we really want to transform our mind, it's not enough just to do um, some meditation, a little meditation every day, and maybe once a week go to the temple or the Dharma center, and the rest of the time the mind is like crazy. It's not going to work. We have to determine that we are going to put the Dharma in the very center of our life. And so that means that everything which we do, we should do with the aspiration to use it on the path. So this is very, really very important. Your family, your workplace is not an obstacle to your practice. It is the opportunity to practice. Actually, it is the practice. How do we deal with the people around us, the people closest to us? Are they happier because we're with them? How are we at work with our colleagues? One thing for daily life, which we should remember is that a very important quality needed on the path to awakening is patience or tolerance. And so it's very easy to be friendly and loving towards people who are lovable. When people are friendly, when people are kind, when people say the kind of things we like to hear, then of course we are all very sweet and nice and friendly back. And that's very nice. I mean, nothing wrong with having people who are nice. But we don't learn very much from that. In fact, if we are always surrounded by people who are very nice and friendly and kind, we might think that, therefore, this shows that I'm really a very nice, friendly person. So what really shows us where we are at are people who are nasty, who are critical, who cause us lots of problems. So then, instead of getting, if somebody is very annoying to us, Instead of responding by being upset and angry and uh, wanting to get revenge, when we meet with people who are, are difficult to us, then rather than that we respond by being angry and upset and wanting to get revenge, we instead should think, oh, good. What a nasty person. <laughs> how, how kind of them. They are helping me to develop patience. There is a whole a section of um, Tibetan Buddhism which deals with how to take difficulties onto the path. And this, is a, um, the, this training in how to respond um, very uh, positively to difficult circumstances is, is something which we need daily life to practice in. I mean, when one is in retreat or by oneself, nice and quiet, everything peaceful, uh, then, you know, it's very difficult to practice uh, qualities like um, uh, patience and so forth, because there's nothing to uh, challenge us. But when we have difficult neighbors or difficult family members and difficult uh, people at work, work colleagues, then we can say, okay, right, now I'm going to get to work. Because we always have a choice. Either we can get upset and angry 
in which case we have a double problem, the problem that the person is causing and the problem which our mind is causing. Or we can say, okay, this is something which I can use for my practice. Because sometimes we, we think that if everything is very easy, that that is the very best. But actually, if everything is always easy, we don't really learn much. I mean, the example from my own life is um, uh, after I, I left the, the cave, then um, I had a choice either to um, go back into retreat or to start a nunnery. And so I was in South India and we went to see um, an astrologer. And so I said to him, well, what should I do? Should I, I go back into retreat or, or should I start a nunnery? So he looked it up and then he said, well, if you go back into retreat, very peaceful, very pleasant, very, very nice, very good. If you start nunnery, many problems, many difficulties, many challenges, <laughs> but both are good, so you choose. <laughs> So then, of course, I thought, okay, back into retreat. But I, I spoke with a, a Catholic priest, and he said, well, of course, you start a nunnery. He said, we are like pieces of rough wood. And if we are always stroking ourselves with silk and velvet, that is very nice but we do not become smooth. He said, we need sandpaper. Sandpaper, very rough, makes us smooth. So therefore, the difficulties that we meet in our lives, the challenges we meet in our lives, we can think, ah, this is my sandpaper. It's very important that we recognize that we are not here in this life just to be comfortable. I mean, many people also come to a spiritual path hoping really in the back of their mind to make samsara uh, more, more comfortable. No? But samsara by its very nature is dukkha, is, you know, dukkha. And so what we need to do is think, rather than merely being uh, comfortable in samsara, how can I use samsara to advance on the path?持专户赵峰国际商业银行南台北分行账号零三零零九零一五七七零户名中华民国国际藏传佛教研究会加入藏研会个人会员每个月一百元中心团体会员每个月一千元联络电话 email ttbtv office at gmail.com 愿世界看见佛法